Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barrick of Wall Street from Main Street and independent financial journalist Eric Dubin. Welcome back to another Welcome to Dystopia podcast. This is episode number nine. Today's special guest worked in the mainstream media as an investigative reporter at CNN and ABC for many years, and he also created the very popular YouTube channel, USA Watchdog. Greg Hunter, thank you for joining us. Yeah, good to be here at my site, usawatchdog.com. <laughs> It's a great site, and you put up videos probably uh, three times a week or so on average. About three right? times a week, yes. I've been and doing that uh, for a long time. And for folks that are not familiar with your work, you also do a uh, weekly news wrap, and that usually gets posted early Friday morning. That's correct. So, you know, you, you've been in alternative media now for a number of years and built up this uh, following, and I'd love to, to know what you think. You What's your take as far as the health of the alternative media now and, uh, and where people are going to get their news? Well, I hear people all the time abandoning it more and more. I mean, if you just looked at, at who they kept at the networks and, and the performance of the networks at, uh, for example, the Republican uh, uh, debates, uh, it was almost childish. I mean, for Jake Tapper to sit there and think this is a good idea, a tactic, well, Mr. Trump, he said this. What would you say about Mr. Trump? And then did you, did, you, did you guys hear the question? That if you were POTUS, what nickname would you have? If I'd have been on that stage, I'd have said, you've got to be kidding me. You're going to waste time Ask me about my freaking nickname that I may have if I'm president or not? Do you, do you, do you not understand how much deep trouble the country is in financially? Like turning the base into a reality show. I mean, these are the people they kept. They kept the people that will act surprised, that will not ask hard questions, and they'll act surprised when something blows up. That's the people they kept. I didn't watch the whole debate. Did they even ask one question about the debt, the debt load? No, they, I don't think they asked anything about uh, – Chris Christie brought it up, uh, and I, at some point in the debate, and it's about halfway through, and I even – I keep it because I backed it up. Um, or I, you know, had a, had a, you know the uh, the recorder on, and I thought, well, what did he just say? They were talking about things that could go wrong. He goes, the implosion of the economy. He said something like that, uh, where they're talking about some of the things that were wrong. You know, the economic implosion or the possibility of the, the the economy imploding. I mean, uh, what we have is criminal enterprise at the top of the financial system. Criminal enterprise. That's not just me. That was even a couple of years ago, Dr. Um, uh, you know, the professor, William Black. He said that these guys, we have felons running the biggest financial institutions. I mean, look at the uh, – Nomi Prince brought this up in her most recent interview that's on the site. As she said, they, uh, we, they paid the big banks, the big six, paid $130 billion in fines and restitution and losses. I mean, how does Jamie Dimon have a have a uh, why is he a darling? They he paid out more than thirty billion dollars in fines, restitution, and losses. Now, he was at the center of the London Trail, tra uh, London, the London Whale trade. He was at the center of that. He came out and announced a two billion dollar, uh, you know, lo possible loss, and it was of uh, six point two billion. He, the smartest guy in the room missed it by four thousand two hundred million. And we're still not prosecuting anyone as significant Nobody's getting the guy that, I mean, the guy that got bagged for the London whale trading was a little small fry trader. Of course. <laughs> Doing what he was thinking, uh, as if he had the power to make a $6 billion uh, lost trade. I mean, come on. And so by appraisal of what's going on, we have basically a criminal enterprise between the government and the uh, the banks. We have no uh, real accounting uh, as far back as uh, April of uh, 2009. They also changed the accounting rules that if one of the big banks get into trouble, they can just lie about their their financials. They have actually made it wrong. Um, we, uh, we have uh, covert and overt money printing in the bond buying arena, uh, which of course has done nothing. Uh, the the Fed, according to uh, all the sources, including my latest interview, Nomi Prince, is a former Wall Street big top Wall Street banker at Goldman, uh, says they're scared to raise rates because they'll crash the markets. I think they will also crash the economy as well. Uh, you know, we have complete total fantasy in media. We don't have a functioning media, at least in the mainstream media. We don't have a functioning media. We don't. They, they can't even get – they, they uh, uh, lie by, omit, by omission on the simplest of things like they talk about how defunding Planned Parenthood and what they say about Planned Parenthood's side is, well, they say the videos are heavily edited and they were secretly recorded. Yeah, but the videos 
unedited versions of their raw video is all over the Center for what Medical Progress, I believe as it is. They're all over the, the, the website in their entirety. And they just leave out the fact, yeah, well, they're edited to show the public, but they're there in their entirety on the uh, uh, Center for Medical Progress, I believe. That's the people who did the things. Uh, they're on there, but they can't add that. That's a lie by omission. I mean, that's, their, that's the Planned Parenthood's attack. Here's another one. You guys should be all over this, right? So when somebody in the mainstream media does ask some hard questions, okay, like the Wall Street Re Journal reporter that uh, asked – what's her name? Yeah. Uh, Pedro da Costa, yeah, right? Da Costa. Yeah. He asked, "How did the Fed kill this? You know, this investigation?" Uh, and he asked about it in March with all of his other, you know, buddies out there, uh, his uh, journalist buddies. And then he asked about it again. He had the the gall to ask about it again, and uh, you know, basically, Wall Street Journal just let him go. Oh yeah, he was. They were told to let him go, though. I'm sure, I'm sure they well. That's your speculation as a as a reporter. I don't know if that they were actually told to let it go, but the the overt facts are that uh, you know he asked uncomfortable questions about a cover up of this information that the Fed supposedly re allegedly released, and they were supposed to be a uh, an investigation uh, on this. And he asked the IG, I want to know if uh, you could tell us where these members of the FMOC who struck down this investigation. And it doesn't not, doesn't not revealing these facts kind of go directly against the sort of transparency and accountability that you're trying to bring to the central bank? Yeah. I mean, this is what his this question, and none of this, none of the people there, they all wink, wink, nod, nod. They got the memo, and and instead of the Wall Street Journal pressuring the Fed, they fire Pedro de Costa. They they well, I don't know if they fire him, but they get rid of him. He's well, escorted, he'll... escorted to the door. Maybe he'll start his own website, Greg, like you, and maybe he'll start um, he'll start uh, doing investigative reporting on his own. Maybe this will this will create something uh, something beautiful out of this uh, you know the the, the problem well, that. But here's the hard thing about doing a your own website: you got to have enough money for the quote unquote cash burn. I mean, you got to live on uh, you know peanut butter and crackers and red beans and rice. You don't get you don't make any money. It takes you years to make money. And if I didn't live a Spartan lifestyle and have some savings, I'd have been, you know, I'd have been a greeter at Walmart. Yeah. I mean, you know. So, uh, but they got rid of him. They got rid of the Wall Street Journal instead of saying, yeah, whoa, you know, the uh, editorial board that we, uh, our reporter asked, and you need to answer what's going on with this investigation. There is my case in point. You don't have a functioning uh, media. Nobody will ask the question, hey, Jamie Dimon, what, $30 billion in losses, restitution, and fines, and how do you still have a job? J.P. Morgan could have bought Dell Computer and had four, five, six, seven billion to spare. How does he still have a job? Well, I think the Justice Department, I heard the Justice Department, there's been stories about this on Zero Hedge and elsewhere, that the Justice Department was told they cannot fire uh, bank executives. They cannot, you know, prosecute or get them fired or anything Who like that because by? the finance. Well, the financial system is supposedly that unstable. Well, th th yeah, obviously, yeah, I mean, the Federal Reserve is cannot raise rates 0.25 percent. They cannot raise rates. That's how that's how crazyville they've got this thing. So absolutely bizarre world, nuttyville. That they can't even and, – and everybody thinks, that, oh, yeah, oh, that, good news. What do you mean good news? I mean, uh, huh? What? It's uh, – you can't raise rates a quarter of a percent? I mean that was a damn uh, – the guys that I were on were saying uh, and I was saying that if they – it's a kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't uh, thing. If they raise rates, uh, then you know the bond market, ding, 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 we're at the bottom and it's up from here, or – uh, they would uh, – people would say, ding, 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 Whew, wow, they really don't have a recovery. Either way, it's going to be bad, and that's what's going on. We don't have a recovery. That's why you have people like Carl Icahn out with a new video talking about how terrible the uh, markets are. He's going to release it, uh, uh, You know, this new video that he's got. This is Carl Icahn, who is a billionaire investor, corporate raider. Um, I don't know how much people like him, but boy, he must think this must be awful bad for him to step out and say the same thing as people like you and uh, and and me and uh, you know all of the alternative media which have been right as rain on this. We don't have a real recovery. That's what Carl Icahn's basically saying that they have screwed this up. What, what's the Fed going to do? 
Yeah, I mean, if the Fed raises rates, I, I've been looking at companies in the developing market right now, their currencies, whether it's Brazil or Canada, these commodity currencies, they leveraged up, they took out debt in U.S. dollars, and they thought that they could have a great economy, you know, exporting commodities to China. And now that the commodity prices have crashed, their currencies are falling, uh, their asset prices have dropped on these companies. A lot of these companies are in major trouble. We've seen the Glencore stories about that, and they have a lot of uh, commodity producing investments. But these companies own, they would be okay if they didn't have that much debt, but they've borrowed their currency, their home currencies has fallen, and they owe debt in U.S. dollars. So if those interest rates did rise, you, it would trigger basically another round of defaults. The emerging markets are basically like the subprime is now, um, unfortunately. Can you imagine the, uh, the size, scale of that? It's, uh, if you're talking about emergency markets uh, as opposed to the subprime, orders of magnitude bigger, which I wonder if they're not going to crash the dollar intentionally. If that isn't going to be the – or if they're going to, uh, you know, like Rielan says, raise rates in December, which, of course, Nobi Prince says, <laughs> laugh, uh, you know, laugh, cue laugh track. Um, she says no way uh, unless they want to – I've been saying this. If they raise rates and they intentionally want to, you know, crash the economy, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't, I, they certainly know. They had, you know, they had Nomi Prince come to the World Bank, uh, Federal Reserve, and IMF at a big conference, and she just filleted them. And she told him she was going to fly him ahead of time. And said, yeah, 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 we want to hear that. <laughs> and so, you know, they they can't raise rates unless they want to crash the market, the economy, the whole deal. I don't know. I mean, are they going to try to crash the dollar, to, to your point, to keep the um, emerging markets from imploding? I don't know. What do you think? Well, they need to provide liquidity. I don't know if they want to crash the dollar necessarily. The dollar is getting too strong, so that's going to hurt exports then for um, – for U.S. companies that uh, that do global business, but also it's perverse in the sense that a lot of these developing countries, you know, they want to get out of the dollar, they want to get out of the system. This is why we're seeing all these BRICS bank announcements, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, but yet a lot of them have so much dollar-denominated debt because it's cheaper. So in the short term, they have enormous debt burden of dollars to pay back, but they want to get out of the system. So um, I, I'm not exactly sure what the uh, solution is going to be to this. I mean, I don't think there's uh, uh, avoiding pain. I think there's only, you know, picking out either delaying pain or less pain or things like that. But what I heard, Greg, a year ago, and I think I told you this in an email uh, a while ago, was in May of 2014, one of my friends in D.C., a money manager, he went to an IMF event and he took notes from presentations from all the major economies were there, their treasury departments and their central banks. And basically they said, you know, the system is – they said even then in May of 2014, the system didn't have much longer to survive – and that uh, they were going to all have to do currency swaps, you know, trillions and trillions of currency swaps with each other. And yes, we've had currency swaps in the past, but they were never that large. And they were always, you know, small emergency amounts uh, in past crises. But it seems to me that that's the only way they're going to be able to keep the system going for even a little bit longer is if everyone does currency swaps. Well, maybe they're doing yeah. it already behind the scenes. I mean, they never really yeah. found out any of that stuff from um... – you know, with this massive currency swap over in Europe, and nobody asked a question about it. And according to uh, Jim Rickards, who I've had on, it says it was trillions of dollars. Yeah. And so, well, uh, you know, and the, my question is, when when are they going to go? You know, hoofs up on we're not selling any more gold. And I think in the pre interview you were talking about the miners, and I I think rich people who aren't disclosing it, who there's no way they would ignore a. A, a non counterparty risk asset, especially when they know everybody with two synapses touching knows the thing is manipulated. Okay, you're, you're buying gold and silver at or below mining costs on the average. So you don't have to be an Einstein to figure out, wow, that's a deal, and wow, look how terrible everything is, and look at the crazy stuff they're doing. They're allowing crime, and they're they're, they're allowing uh, you know manipulation and uh, the outright money laundering for drug cartels and countries on the uh, terror list, and I, maybe that's what the Iran deal is all about. Maybe they just tried to make some kind of a deal so they could keep the system floating longer. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know, but do you think that we're getting to a – you know all about the mining industry. Are, are – a, are they really selling gold and silver at about average mining cost? B, when, are they, when is this thing going to be hoofs up? I think people want to know that, and I don't know the answer. I think we're getting close, though, but what, what do you guys think? Well, what I, what I would say about the mining industry is that the miners have lost enormous amounts, most of them, not, not all of them, but most of them since 2011 have lost enormous amounts of money all the way down. So it's basically, to use an analogy, uh, Wiley Coyote chasing the Roadrunner, and the miners are Wiley Coyote. 
and the manipulated paper, gold, and silver price is the roadrunner. So basically, you have the miners since 2011 playing this catch-up game, trying to cut costs as fast as they can, and yet the paper, every time they cut costs enough where they think they can maybe survive and make a profit, the paper metal price drops even more. And this game has been going on since 2011, and there's really no more capital available for most of the miners in the form of debt or equity. So now we're, we've gotten to a tipping point. It's taken, you know, obviously four years for this to occur, but most of the miners, I've, I've interviewed mining contacts, and I've spoken with them off the record and stuff. There's just really not much capital available for most of them. So we're going to see forced mergers and acquisitions in the near future. We're going to see uh, mines put on care and maintenance in the near future, and we're going to see miners go bankrupt in, in the near future, too. Because despite cost cutting, I mean, Pan American Silver, I just looked at their balance sheet uh, two weeks ago, and I was looking at, at their mines, and they have seven primary silver mines, and three out of the seven, Greg, they've cut a lot of costs in the last couple of years. They've cut costs 40%. Three out of seven are still losing massive amounts oh of money. My God. But, but they're all in costs or $14.50, but three out of those seven mines are still, you know, $16.50, $17.00. $15, you know, those types of prices. So I don't know how much longer this can go on, but if they can sell shares or maybe get a little bit of debt or something, maybe they can buy another six months or 12 months, but the, they're running out of road. Are they, are, do you think the powers that be are trying to, to bankrupt us so they can buy them on cheap? No. I mean, that's where the money uh, is. That's where the money is in the mines. Instead of nationalizing the mines, you know, which would be kind of a, you know, terrible red flag signal. <laughs> Uh, they would just bankrupt them and buy them and take control of them. What do you think? Yeah, you mean literally you and the United States Treasury owning the shares? Or, or their, or their, um, or their agents like uh, you know J.P. Morgan or or Goldman or whoever, just buying them up and holding them and you know, making cr well, crazy amounts of money on them. Well, the the former, the former, one of the former directors of Goldman Sachs is now the CEO of Barrick Gold. So <laughs> I, I can't, I don't know if ev that's that way with every miner, but Barrick Gold has been involved in the past uh, with some with some uh, allegations, let's just say, of impropriety, uh, impropriety with their uh, gold hedging contracts and things like that. There's allegations of that out there on the internet. <laughs> I I just think it's a, a terrible time. Uh, because people are going to lose their faith in, you know, Martin Armstrong, who's a smart guy, been a guest on my show, uh, you know, says that gold will only go up when people lose their confidence in government. And to a large degree, I believe him. But I wanted to add to that, and I was just thinking about this in preparation for our interview. And I'm thinking to myself, here we have this this phone, the whole thing we laid out with the criminal activity popping this up, and you can't you know prosecute big bankers, and you have uh, you know phony accounting at FASB, and uh, accounting rules suspended if you're a systemically important you know important uh, institution, and zero percent interest rates, and all kinds of overt and covert money printing and, and currency swaps and all that, and then we have the uh, this giant echelon of of bad debt, and uh, you know the debt we've been told debt is an asset. And we've been told uh, that uh, that that money is uh, that debt is money. We're going to find out neither is true, and we have all this debt as an asset because we've been on this long curve, interest rates going down since you know Paul Volcker days in 1980. And uh, what, what's going to happen when this debt is revealed uh, unpayable, and that the collateral is no good? And how fast do you think people will lose faith in government when they tell people getting, you know, fifteen hundred dollars a month in Social Security, we'll only be able to give you two hundred bucks a month? Hey, uh, you guys in the Air Force and Marines and and uh, Army and Navy who are getting a pension, yeah, you're getting two thousand, three thousand a month. We can give you two or three hundred a month. How fast do you think people will lose faith in government when this this when the debt is revealed unpayable and then all the derivatives, which is exponential, it's what is it, a quadrillion or two? The Bank of International Settlement says it's a quadrillion. I mean, that's the official number, a quadra, a thousand trillion, a thousand trillion, a trillion is a thousand billion. At a thousand trillion, just use the official number. And some people say it's twice that. You know, it's two quadrillion. But it, the number is so big. What happens if the derivatives blow sky high and create a financial black hole? How fast? And this is my question. How fast do you think people will lose faith in government? Well, very fast. Less than a week. Oh my you God! Know, uh, rolling stock of three days of food on on our highways is is the you know just in time inventory system. <laughs> so it isn't even just people who are on pensions and EBT cards or what have you. It's yeah. everybody. The whole the credit system would shut down. 
Uh-uh. Well, that's why I think you have to, uh, and I don't sell gold or silver. I'm a reporter, so I don't sell anything. I don't care where people get it. Uh, but you got to have – I think you, first and foremost, you have to have good tires on your car and a new battery and, and your house functioning good, and uh, and then you need food and water. And this is, all takes time to do this, to prepare. And uh, just like you said, just-in-time supply management, you know, there is no back. The back is the front. Uh, you know, you barcode, boop, and you buy something, and then the computer orders it because the time value of money. They don't want the stuff sitting on their sh- on, on in the back. They don't want to have any inventory where they have to pay for that. It's like having you know a negative interest uh, you know outflow. And so, to your point, I mean the supply chain. And I think when I had Jim Sinclair on, he brought this up, made it very clear that this you better have three to six months, uh, you know, three at least, and really six months is ideal of uh, food uh, and water um, because it could be that bad for. That long, yeah. and I'm thinking to myself, "Woo, boy!" Uh, and then you have all these stories that keep coming out on places like Zero Hedge, which, for example, UBS is about. This is the title: UBS is about to blow the cover on a massive gold rigging scandal. Well, we've heard that before, but when do you think, uh, like, when do you think that that, that we could have a, 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 you know, a force majeure or you know, a, a the hear news of uh, out of LBMA and Comex or wherever? Uh, we're not selling. Sorry. Uh, when do you think that might happen? That we just might have a no bid, a no at any. Forget, sorry, we, we're not selling. Do you, and you guys cover the miners, you guys cover gold and silver all the time, and I think that's a, a a pivotal key question. When do you think that might happen? Do you think we're close? Yeah, we are. I mean, we have the underlying conditions for it to happen with any significant increase in demand. So you know, it, it, it would. It could respond to a geopolitical event or whatever that would just spike up the gold demand and people deciding to attempt to take delivery out of Comex and out of the LVMA, such that the, you know, it, the well, powers that be would freak out and they'd declare force majeure and cash settle on the contracts uh, in lieu of paying the gold. Well, there's that much there. I mean, is there? I mean, is there that much there in inventory well, according to Bill Alter? It's like ridiculously, well, you know, like the numbers billions. probably aren't I mean, real. Not even a billion. <laughs> it's unbelievably small in terms of the size of the overall market. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> yeah, people are operating on the assumption that comics is a paper trading game, and, and no one's testing the system, and it's almost that bad in LBMA. But someday that's going to change, and when it does, then you know they'll probably declare force majeure. I doubt those numbers are real, too, about the inventory. But, Greg, something we do see, though, is every time no, – Wait, stop, stop, You mean they're not even – there's less than what they're saying? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, look, the, the SLV prospectus, the GLD prospectus, there are so many legal loopholes there. I mean, they could basically take the metal out of GLD and SLV if they want and use that to deliver futures contracts if they have to, uh, take the metal out of there if there is any metal left in either, and they could just replace those with futures contracts. All it says in the prospectus for the uh, – physical metal trust for GLD and SOV is that they mimic the price. It doesn't say that they actually have holdings. Uh, ask <laughs> oh, someone, my God. Yeah, ask someone who's trying to get conversion of the metal, who's actually trying to take it out, if you're not a Wall Street investment bank. So if you're a custodian or a Wall Street investment bank, you're allowed to remove metal. And for the last couple of years, they have been removing a lot of gold and selling it for a big premium in, in India. But I think, you know, the lower the paper metals price goes, we're seeing this on the exports of the U.S., the more metal, uh, the more silver that's shipped to India. They've been buying a massive amount of silver. I think they're on pace, Greg, to buy over 10,000 metric tons of silver this year, and that's over 30% of the whole silver market, and yet the paper price dropped. And the demand has exploded well, in silver. And, and, you know what? Great point. Because that's what uh, uh, Paul Craig Roberts, who I've interviewed several times on my channel, he's a you know, his former uh, assistant treasury secretary. He's the father of Reaganomics, you know, that whole bound deal. And uh, he's a PhD in economics. And uh, he says, you know, you can't have you – can't, and this is the proof that it is manipulated. You cannot have rising demand – Falling inventory and falling prices, unless it's manipulated. You know, rising exactly. demand and falling inventory should equal rising prices, and it's not. Yep. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and we got to be getting close to the to the you know to the moment of truth. The other thing is, people say, "Well, it hasn't blown up yet." I just had Warren Pollock on, who's a smart guy. He says, "Oh yes, it has blown up." Oh, you're so wrong. Globally, it's blown up and it's imploding from the outer rim in. 
And, uh, you know, we've had 40% knocked out of, uh, of China's stock market. We've had these, you know, a uh, couple thousand points knocked out of the U.S. stock market. You've got the Federal Reserve that can't raise interest rates a quarter of a percent because, you know, the economy is not doing well. And what do they mention? They mention Chinese China. And you have uh, also uh, China just announced over the weekend, just over the weekend, I know it's a country of 1.3 billion people, but they just announced a 100,000-man Layoff in the coal industry, a hundred thousand. Poof! Can you imagine the ripple effect of that even in China? Yeah, and the Chinese factories, Greg, are starting to switch to robots and automation too. This is a story we've been covered. So because of these artificially manipulated cheap interest rates and politicians trying to force minimum wage laws higher. It's going to create the unintended consequences of you're going to see mining companies, you're going to see restaurants, you're going to see a lot of these businesses switch then to touchscreens and robots and automation then in the near future as well. Just got out of, uh, just came in, just a case in point there, just to back up what you said. Here's a real life uh, backup of what you're uh, saying, and that is uh, I just got out of um, um, Red Robin. And what do they have? A little kiosk on every table. You can order from your table. You can order from your table. And so I uh, thought, hmm, that's new. Swipe your credit card, and you can uh, just right there. Just, just the, you, you would need a lot less wait staff. And exactly, exactly. And you know, these are unintended consequences there of of politicians and central bankers trying to do this to the economy. You know, forcing interest rates down with financial repression. So the capital, when the capital is a lot cheaper. It, it might have been in a free market, the capital would have been a lot more expensive to invest in robotics and things like that. But when the capital is almost zero, oh, great you're point. seeing all these mergers. Oh, yeah. fantastic point. That is a great point. Uh, I, I heard, too, that a lot of uh, manufacturing is going to come back to the U.S., and it's going to come back in the form of robotics. I mean, the, the latest yep. – uh, I saw this about, mm, I don't know, four or five months ago. They're going to build a 2016 Camaro, Camaro where? In Detroit. You know they're not going to be using a lot of UAW workers for that. You know they're going to be using robotics for that. Yeah. And there won't be any, oh, this car was made on Friday. Yeah, there won't be any difference. <laughs> the the robot uh, eats and drinks the same on, on Monday or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It doesn't make any difference. And it doesn't demand um, you know, salary increases. It doesn't demand promotions immediately, and it doesn't need all this health care. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why – uh, you know, these companies with cheap capital and politicians trying to force wages higher, these things are going to create uh, businesses then saying, you know what, I can't handle, my business is not profitable, I can't handle these cost increases, I'm going to have to switch. Well, I, I do think that we're, it, we just getting, we're getting this, this, this feedback loop that's going faster and faster and getting more shrill and more shrill. And uh, I say, and I've been saying this, when it happens, this is going to happen at a very fast speed. This is going to happen to the speed of the Internet, not the speed of 1933. This is going to happen at the 1929. It's not going to happen at that, and they had another thing in 1937. This is going to happen at the, at the – not the speed of 1929. It's going to happen at the speed of 2015, 2016, the internet speed, the nanosecond speed. This is going to just be unbelievable. Uh, it, it, people are going to be stunned. They're going to be stupefied at how fast and how bad, how quickly, how fast and how quickly this goes sour. And I think that's what the video warning of Carl Icahn, you can like him or not like him or whatever, but I think people like him don't want to be viewed as, oh my gosh, you weasel, you profited on all of us, and, and you were the part of the economy that really that did well with all the bailouts, because he know he didn't say anything about the bailouts. Why wasn't Carl Icahn saying, talking about these bailouts in 2009? How about that weasel Warren Buffett? Or they Charlie were all Munger. buying like crazy. They Buffett were buying. Running run the other side of the trade from the treasury. Getting oh, of course they were. Of course they were. Charlie Munger used that tactic to get over it. No, you know what should have happened? You got, Warren Buffett, I, in my opinion, is a complete failure. He required a government bailout. You know, everybody thought right. he was cute by loaning General Electric money at 10%. Oh, they would have gone out of business, wouldn't they? They thought he was cute by loaning money you know, at Goldman Sachs. Oh, yeah, they would have gone under two. And all those other companies, you know, Wells Fargo and American Express and many companies in the Berkshire Hathaway funds would have taken a pie in the face, and he would have been relegated to – he would have been he would have been remembered in the dustbin of history as, a, as, a, as an idiot imbecile who required – and he instead, he took his government bail out, and he, uh, you know, uh, uh, turbocharged his investment. Lloyd Blankbein should have – he shouldn't even have been a greeter at Walmart, and he's now a billionaire. 
It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, the people that, that we don't have functioning media. Anybody like me that would say that on the mainstream media, oh, bye-bye, we're taking you off the air. They would. And they took me back in 2008. Knowledge. It's on my site. You can go on my site, go to the about section, and look at what I was saying back in, in early 2008. And this, I've been, I was saying it in 2007 as well with with uh, Ali Velshu. Are we, in, you know, Ali, are we in a uh, uh, a, a recession? Yes. You can't knock out cars, the housing, and I mean, the car industry is floating on a sea of subprime, no money down debt. So is the uh, real estate uh, interest, uh, industry. I just had a friend of mine, uh, actually my cousin, sell his house. It was a it was a quarter of a million dollar house, right? This is the sale. It's in Missouri. Quarter of a million dollar house. And I said, wow, you two hundred fifty thousand. Well, you really got two forty five. And uh, we had to give him back five thousand dollars at closing. Whoa, quarter of a million dollar buy, no money down, five thousand dollars refunded at closing to pay the closing costs. We also have a lot of student loan debt too. Grant. A trillion. And let me tell you what they ought to be doing with the, uh, you know, Harvard and all these, uh, you know, people with all these endowments. Hey, why don't you pony up this money, you weasels? Because you 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 saddle up these kids with debt, and nobody sat in the counselors' chambers and said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, hold on a minute. You ever think about a part-time job? Maybe night school. No, no, no. You know, party on, Wayne. You know, let's get let's go up to the federal trough and get a, and borrow a trillion dollars. And they should take this money out of their endowments instead of trying to, you know, turbocharge their endowments. Take that money and pay off a percentage of your students' uh, debt that you guys have allowed them to belly up to the trough. But, oh, no, no, you can't put that idea out there on the mainstream media. Oh, my gosh, are you kidding? Yeah, I mean, the universities keep raising tuition prices every year. The government credit bubble, I mean, almost everyone can get a student loan debt, and this allows the, the universities to keep raising tuition prices. It's a, it's definitely kind of a Ponzi scam type of type of finance there. Now, obviously, some degrees are still pretty good, but, I mean, if you have over $100,000 in student loan debt with a graduate degree and you can't get a halfway decent full-time job, I mean, your debt load, you're, you're, you're going to be in default. Um, you're even with a full-time job, you're probably barely getting by. Now, Greg, you have a large audience. What percentage of your listeners would you say are struggling financially in this economy and also have their bills going up? I would, I would say everybody. Probably half my half my audience is probably is, is is young, actually, because you know people don't young people 35 and younger they don't go to they don't watch uh, you know David Muir on the CBS World or the uh, you know the nightly news or World News Tonight at, at ABC or the CBS they don't watch they don't watch that stuff. And it's just, incidentally, it's just stuff they get out of the you know the uh, the New York Times, and then they do the story and put video to it that night. That's what they do. Now, I'm not kidding you. That's what they do. I've seen it. That's what they do, and uh, they, they, you know, I'd say half the audience. Dude, a lot of people are struggling. A lot of people are always asking, "What should the common person do?" And that's why I'm very reticent to tell people to go out and buy gold and silver unless you have everything else done. If you have, you know, a good car and new tires and new battery and good tune-up and low debt load and food and water and your house in good shape, sure. But most people can't even do all that before they get to even buying yourself a, you know, a ten dollar roll of 1963 quarters. Yeah, what what I tell people, Greg, is first people should invest in their self. They should, you know, educate themselves and add skills as efficiently as possible, so they can maybe have a part time job, you know, fixing cars or computers or things like oh that. Oh my maybe god, there's so many young people. They don't know which way a nut screws. Yeah. I mean, most of my friends' kids who are 30. They're like, do you know how to change your oil? No, I didn't know how to change my oil. You're an idiot. Are you kidding me? You're dead. I mean, you know, well, you think about Walking Dead. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to do anything. That's gonna eat your I don't know how to play video bad. games. That's gonna be great with an EMP attack. You're gonna be really useful. Well, unfortunately, Greg, I think a lot of that has to do with the government school system. I mean, they don't, just don't teach you that you need to learn all these skills. They teach you, you know, if you work hard in school and you get good grades, then you could go get a job and you earn a lot of money and you'll be fine. Yes. But, you know, that, that paradigm, that mindset, it, for most people, it just doesn't work now anymore, especially when you have a lot of student loan debt and there's so many people looking for a good full-time job. So people are just going to have to be, you know, entrepreneurial now. They're going to have to think outside the box. They're going to have to look for ways to creatively add extra sources of income, you know, well, uh, on the side there. Let me tell you, I tell people all the time, you know, they say, they say, well, I'm, oh, you know, how, tell me what I should do. I, do you have a data package? Yeah. Get rid of it. Do you have cable TV? Yeah. Cut it off. Uh, do you go out to eat? Yeah. Stop doing that. I mean, yeah, listen, there's no magic potion to keep you from being screwed in what's coming. 
and it's already coming. It's it's coming. It is here. It is we've got our Federal Reserve that cannot raise interest rates a quarter of a percent because the economy is so dreadful. And if they do, it will implode the whole thing uh, and create the biggest black hole you've ever seen, which is coming anyway, whether the, no matter what. It's coming anyway, just because they don't raise interest rates. Because they can't make this go away. They cannot make this go away. They have, they have completely screwed the pooch on how they handle this. And back in 2009, when I first went on, I wrote a piece called Default Hopper. You can go on my site and said they should just default. They should take their money printing ability and insure all the depositors. That would be the um, uh, the six trillion dollars. I mean, what do we spend? Uh, uh, Captain Austin Fitz says forty trillion. What are the uh, the University of Missouri, uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, uh, you know, professor there? And in December of eleven said we spent twenty nine trillion. Well, it you know, kind of jives, you know. We're up to about forty trillion. We spent we could have spent six trillion. If you believe in capitalism, and I do, you got to believe in bankruptcy. And so what we have is not capitalism. We have a, a very few select bankruptcies, but we don't have the real bankruptcies of malinvestments, which is the real uh, regulator in the market. You know, you make a bad investment, you know, like Lloyd Blankfein, and you lose your job and your company, uh, all the assets go poof. And you no longer have a job, and all your assets get divvied up by competent people. Whoa, that's regulation. Yeah, and you know all the people like Greenspan and others that were arguing for deregulating everything and taking apart. As long as you deregulate and that, you I get mean, to live with your 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 choices. Yeah, and, that well, is, oh, it, it, well, and the ironic thing about Greenspan and all of his ilk was that they would always claim, "Well, the markets will take care of the regulation." The trouble is, is that they always put the Greenspan put in. You know, the yes, if they the let the markets take care of it. Yes. The, the thing about the derivatives market, guys, is it was so much larger than the economy, so there was an implicit guarantee there that the Federal Reserve would just bail out a lot of the banks. So, I mean, it's, they've been thinking about that for a while. People were actually surprised they let Lehman fail. And in hindsight, you know, obviously I'm in favor of letting banks fail, but we have criticism where, you know, they say now that the one move the Federal Reserve made as a mistake was Ben Bernanke let Lehman Brothers fail. And I think that was one of the few right moves he did, you know, because these guys shouldn't shouldn't have been bailed out. But that the world we live in now is where up is down, where left is right, where inside is out. Uh, welcome to dystopia where, you know, they the, the natural things that would have happened in the past, people are heavily criticized for. Well, remember uh, Bill Clinton who signed away. Well, you know, there's not one piece of evidence that getting rid of the Glass-Steagall Act, which is the, you know, the Graham-Bliley-Leak Act, which is the, you know, allowed, uh, you know, the pigs at Citigroup and Sandy Weil, you know, uh, in, incorporate all these companies and get too big to fail. And, uh, th but the other thing uh, that, that happened was they didn't let anybody go bankrupt. They didn't let anybody go bankrupt, and Democrats and Republicans alike share in this scam. And if they would have, that would have been the best regulation that they could have ever done in a million years. And they, then there, therein lies the problem. The other thing was the uh, unregulation of derivatives, which Brooks Lee Bourne wanted to do at the CFTC, and of course she was shown the door and criticized heavily. Which you know meant uh, you know that right now, if you take a look at derivatives, and Jim Sinclair is famous for this, he says, look at derivatives, because uh, if you ask anybody in the derivative market, what is there standards for derivatives, and they'll look at you, and uh, no. Okay, so no standards. Any guarantees for der derivatives? Uh, no. Any oversight of derivatives? Uh, no. Okay, so no standards, no guarantees, no oversight, no regulation whatsoever. Wow, what could go wrong in a quadrillion derivative market? What could go wrong? <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 a it's a bad casino there uh, that they don't have the money to cover the losses. It's, it's, but I guess they're, it's it, beyond that. It is so amplified by orders of magnitude that when it gets going, I mean your pensions, your retirement, your brokerage accounts. I mean the brokerages that are uh, that are exposed to this. There is no FDIC for them. They're SIPC. That's a joke. That's a couple of billion dollars of insurance, SIPC, the Securities Investment Protection Corporation. Right. That's a joke. That is a total joke. And people the think – The FDIC doesn't have any money either. That they have exactly. to their uh, uh, so, you, so you wonder if people go, they're good bugs. Really? So you're a paper bug. So you think that this is going to work out. Because the overt evidence, I'm just quoting official numbers. This is not my number. This is the Bank of International Settlements. That's why I always say, wow, just, let's just use the official number, a quadrillion. It's like, Jay, it's like you owe me $5 million. Whether it's 500000 or $5 million, do you have your $5 million? Do you have 500000 Can you pay me that? What, what difference does it make? 
you can't pay it, right? Yep. That's what I'm saying. So it, it, I'm sure it's more than a quadrillion. If the official number is a quadrillion at the Bank of International Settlements, you know it's, I don't know, a quadrillion. I do, who knows? Three, who knows? Uh, there's no public market for it, so you don't really know exactly. Even ISDA, you know, the security, you know, the derivatives people, they don't know. They don't know. This is me to you stuff. This is the counter. This is a person to person, peer to peer crap. That's it's unbelievable. And if, yeah, if, if if this thing gets going, that's why people are going to be stunned, stunned at the side. What are the four or five biggest banks have? What two hundred trillion plus of derivatives, most of which, according to uh, Paul Craig Roberts, who knows a little something about big money, uh, former uh, assistant to Treasury Secretary Paul Craig Roberts, he says, well, you know, uh, that's eighty percent of its interest rate swaps. Yeah, Rob Kirby said the same thing. I'm well, and, and here's another one. I got this from uh, Gordon Long, who brought up this little tidbit. It says, you know what uh, Christine Lagarde did before she did the IMF? I said, what's that? Of course, she wants to – she's thinking about quitting. I guess she is. He says she ran a law firm of 2,700 lawyers that did nothing but derivative lit litigation. Oh, excuse me? What? She's an expert on derivatives? Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's. I'm scratching my chin. Hmm. And she's wanting to, uh, you know, the reports are. Yeah, I don't know if I want, you know, to stay in the best hotels, to have a cool salary, and get set around the world. I don't know if I want to do that anymore at 56. Really? Yeah, that's not the real reason. <laughs> that's what I well. She I doesn't just, want to be the. She doesn't want to be the bag holder. Probably like that's probably why Ben Bernanke left, right? Because he could go back to his job in academia and get tenure and charge two hundred fifty thousand dollars for dinner or speaking engagement. Back to. Um, Back to uh, Carl Icahn. So why is Carl Icahn? What is he out doing? You know, saying all oh, this is crazyville. You know, he was bellying up to the bar along, along with the other is uh, you know point oh oh one percent buddies and thought the bailouts were fabulous and they had to do something and they were doing it. And now he's oh my God, they've totally screwed up. Why in the hell was he out in two thousand nine saying you gotta let these guys go belly up? You gotta let these banks go under. You know, with the, that's going to be a, the best uh, market uh, regulator in the world is, is bankruptcy. And why wasn't he doing it? Now he's out saying, oh, it's all screwed up. Really? Why weren't you saying this in you know, 2009 when you were way underwater and your investments were taking a hit? How about Warren Buffett, that weasel? Everybody thinks that he's, oh, he's Uncle Warren. Oh, what a weasel. What a weasel. Greg, uh, my, my final question for you is why do you think the mainstream financial media is releasing so many negative gold articles, including calling gold a pet rock? Oh, okay. come on, man. This is uh, – this is exactly the disinformation, uh, the, as I've said, we don't have a functioning media, and the media is objective, so that's unobjective. And so because they know that they, in the end, people are going to – It's uh, oh, yes, uh, here's why. Because in the end, this mountain of paper – Chris Martinson gave a great analogy of this, and he says, here we have this mountain of paper. We had a mountain of paper in 2008, and what they do, they add it to the mountain of paper, but the mountain but – the, but the molehill of, of, of tangible assets, you know, gold, land, silver, artwork, maybe grew a little bit, but not – I mean, but the mountain of paper, what's going to happen when everybody wants out of that paper and into these real assets? Because they don't want to stampede of people who are in paper thinking that they have paper wealth and they don't have diddly squat. They don't even own it. They can't get access to it when it blows up, and they don't want this mountain of paper liquefied into what uh, assets that are there right now. That's why. That's the big picture, and gold is part maybe, of that uh, a real tangible asset. Maybe because they're going into gold themselves, like they've been shorting the paper gold and silver markets, and they've been buying gold and silver themselves. Well, you said the, the mainstream people. media, uh, the financial oh, media. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, Wall Street. Though, Wall maybe. Street, though. Yes, yes. But uh, that, but I think uh, you know this, and the people that are uh, there's a reason why Egon von Greyers is doing brisk business over in uh, sweet uh, was it uh, Switzerland? Switzerland. Uh, because rich people are not stupid; they have money. Because pe rich people have money, they inherit it, and then they also uh, are smart. And I mean, Warren, uh, Donald Trump inherited a, a pretty big fortune. Uh, I mean, he had three hundred million dollar head start, but you know, nothing like ten billion. Now, I don't know how much of that survives this next crash, but uh, but but he but he's a smart guy. You, whether you like him or not, I'm not Trump, and I'm not stuffing for Trump. But whether you like him or not, you cannot say he's stupid. He's a good businessman. Yeah, I've read his book. He's not stupid. 
And uh, that's about that's one of the features of people with money. I mean, the ones that inherit money and then end up with you know uh, going backwards are you know they're probably ingrained stupid people. But people like Trump and rich people in general are not stupid, and they also have access to the best information. I mean, people like Trump don't hang around with people like me. You know, I'm a dodo bird compared to the people he hangs out. Unconnected dodo bird. I mean, I just look at the news and say, here's here's what I think is going on. But he has the inside, the real information from people. Who, which he'll never say, incidentally. He'll never say that. That's why he blurted out during the can't during the uh, CNN. Uh, uh, you should. It's somewhere right in the middle. They're talking about something going wrong, uh, the economy imploding. That's what he said. Something like that. And I thought to myself, wow, and nobody even that even didn't even spark a, a question. What do you mean by that? Oh, hold on a minute. What do you mean by that, Mr. Trump? The economy imploding. Do you think the economy is going to implode? We have a great recovery going on now. And so that's – the reason why the mainstream financial media is calling it a pet rocks because they don't want to see this fantasy of paper liquefied into real assets. And that's why they always say you know, rich people ultimately always go back to owning land. Why? Because it's real. It's tangible. That's why. That's why – what did, what did Ted, uh, Ted Turner do when he got cashed out at, the, at CNN? What did he do? You know, buy a fourth of the state of what Wyoming or something? Right. right. Yeah, Montana. I think he he created a buffalo ranch up there in Bison. Yeah, it's not really a fourth of the state, but but it, you know, what do you <laughs> buy a couple million acres? You, yep, you see what yep. I'm saying? And so that's what. So to to answer your question, that's what the financial press is doing. It's really disinformation and lying. And I know a lot about this. They don't want people like me on CNN. I will tell you, I'll leave you with this last thing. First of all, disinformation, lying by omission, that's the mainstream press. Okay, And uh, I will tell you this. I was – I was, and you could see it. I was on set with Ali Velshi and what's her name, one of the one of the business chicks there. I can't remember. I'm so sorry. I can't remember her name for that right now. As soon as I hang up, I'll remember. But anyway, but I'm on my about section talking about the uh, how we're in, headed for deep trouble and how the housing market is going to implode, and it's not going to subprime, it's not going to be contained. And, and oh, oh, and my favorite thing, all the banks were in trouble. I was saying this in March of 2008. People looked at me like I had two heads. And later that year, after they let me go at CNN, which is the best thing that ever happened to me, incidentally, uh, later that year, they were in the newsroom in the New York Bureau in like around October or November, and one of the top execs was in from Atlanta and, and you know, was chiding everyone, saying, how can we miss this? And one producer raised their hand and said, Greg Hunter was all over this. He said all the banks were in trouble. The real estate market was going to go under. He was all over it. Boom, change of story. Boom. I wasn't wrong. And I wasn't brilliant either. I mean, as an investigative reporter, all I looked at was data. What I did unusual was I never did – Economy work. I never worked on the economy. You know, I just looked at how many. You know, if you're doing investigative reporting, you know, what's the data on depleted uranium munitions? What's the data on a big massive defect that kills people? What's what's the data say? And I just looked at the data, and the data said, "Woo, woo, we're terrible." And then how can you make that case? What, what are the people that can that can come out and speak toward this? What are their credentials? And wow, I had great credential people, smart people. They didn't want that. But so to your point, to answer your question, what do you think about all the uh, you know stories coming out about gold being pet rot? That's disinformation. That is not what they don't want people knowing the truth. They want people uh, right where they are because in order for them to change the currency and and to, and to have their way with the public, they can't all run to the right side of the trade. They have to have them on the wrong side of the trade. And this isn't even a trade. This is more about you know real assets and how to protect yourself, not a trade. So that's my my point. My point is that you know think for yourself and turn off the use the mainstream media as kind of a message board and read between the lines. And some of the stuff they say is true, and some of the stuff they just leave out, and some of the stuff is just an outright you know distortion. Yeah, definitely good advice. We gotta be in charge of our own information curating. It's coming, though, boys. It's coming. Out there. We're, we're, this is not an if. This is not an if. This is not a maybe. The data says that we're going to have a one horrible calamity. Look at the interest rate posture. Look at the derivatives. Look at the unpayable bonds. And, that, and, I, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to close with this. We've been told that debt is money, Federal Reserve note, and that debt is an asset, all these bonds. And we're going to find out neither is true. And the bonds are are the collateral, and what's going to happen when the collateral is deemed unpayable and no good? What's going to happen? 
a mad dash for collateral, baby. Yep, we're going to be back to 2008 then or worse. Oh, I mean, we're going to be back are... to the Stone Ages, man. It's going to be Mad Max. People are going to be trading shotgun shells for fuel. Well, I mean, it's a it's a high probability that eventually we may get there, but I I hope I hope for everyone's sake that you're wrong. But um, you know, the data, the economy is just not looking good. Almost all the full time jobs created, Greg, since 2008 were high paying oil jobs, and the oil prices <laughs> crashed in the United States, so those jobs are basically gone. Thank you, Obama. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Fantastic job stewarding the economy. Thank you, Republicans. Fantastic job pushing through a secret trade deal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for – who do you work for? Oh, yeah, all these guys are puppets. <laughs> okay, Greg, well, I, I want to thank you very much for your time. You gave our listeners a very powerful interview. Uh, please tell our listeners more about USA Watchdog. Uh, USAWatchdog.com. You can Google Greg Hunter and the Greg Hunter. I trademarked that name. And, uh, you know, it's uh, go to usawatchdog.com, and, and uh, you'll, you can get to the YouTube channel and see the view. Now, what I write on the on the website is more in-depth than I do on YouTube, and the reason why is I don't own YouTube. I like YouTube. There's nothing wrong with them. But I put my all my work and, and all the good stuff goes into usawatchdog.com, all the links, all the – all the long, deeper write-throughs, all the comments after the interview, all that stuff goes on usawatchdog.com, and uh, not the YouTube channel because you know Google owns YouTube. So, uh, but they're good and they're fine. I don't have any problem. I'm not trashing them, but I'm saying just go to the website. It's the priority. usawatchdog.com. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for your time, Greg. And uh, you know, I'd like to have you back on in the future for another Welcome to Dystopia podcast, where we kind of talk about what's wrong with the economy, and maybe then we'll have a brighter future than after we have, you know, some type of crash or or bust or or uh, malinvestment is finally cured. You're going to be uh, covering this for a long, long time. We got school shotgun shells too for trading, so come on, you go. next time. Yeah, yeah, go buy yourself. I like four shot. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Great to see you. Thanks for having me on, fellas. Okay, Eric. Uh, that was a great, powerful interview from Greg Hunter. He went on some great rants. But now it's time for our Scumbag of the Week nominees. Uh, in, in today's Scumbag of the Week nominees, one of the funniest ones I found, this was kind of ridiculous, was British Prime Minister David Cameron allegedly committed sex acts to a pig in an attempt to be admitted to a super-exclusive club at Oxford. I mean, to give him credit, I think it was a dead pig, but hey, you know. <laughs> these <laughs> rituals of getting in on all these secret societies and whatnot are pretty funny. In the Skull and Bones case, the lead organization out of Yale, uh, President Bush, President Bush Jr., uh, John Kerry, I mean, the list of people who have been members is as, as long as your arm. It's amazing. Uh, they supposedly uh, get into a coffin naked and masturbate and declare all of their sexual secrets and uh, and expose themselves to any kind of questions that anyone uh, is into that who is a member of the Skull and Bones uh, Society uh, is there. And then they uh, this is the ritual that these creeps go through to get initiated. It's kind of a power game to get control over somebody. And this is the same kind of thing that David Cameron has now been discovered to be in fault with. And, uh, you know, hey. I, mean, I guess the guy uh, likes a bestiality. What can you say? <laughs> yeah. So, so these guys do these things, I guess, to get into this club because it guarantees them with jobs and connections and things like that. And I guess what they have to do these things. So, um, they have blackmail material on each other. So, um, you know, they know then that that the information was released then by one of their secret society brothers. Then, if the information came out, is 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 that what goes on at these things? Then you think? Yeah. Well, that's one of the explicit purposes of doing these kind of rituals, and then it's also just psychologically prostating the new initiate into the club so that they feel like they you know, owe allegiance to it. It's uh, you know, conditioning to see it as having authority over oneself. Uh, and you know, all of them are always involving creepy things, you know, something that's demeaning sexually or whatever. <laughs> it tells you a little bit about the psychology of the people behind these organizations. Well, the funny thing is I was actually just reading a biography I just finished. It's only 68 pages of John Maynard Keynes that uh, Murray Rothbard wrote about him, and Keynes was into some really weird sexual stuff too. Um, I think he was boys. one 
Well, yeah, and he was also like a uh, hardcore bisexual, and he, uh, I think he went to a lot of those, you know, um, that Johnny Depp's movie, Ninth Gate, where, you know, there were those rich, older Europeans who went to castles and had like devil worshipping and orgies. I think Keynes was into weird orgy stuff like that, like, and bisexuality. He was in a very weird London club among intellectuals, British intelligentsia. So, I mean, you know, none of this stuff is ever really talked about with Keynes for the most part. You'll never hear anything bad mentioned about Keynes in the mainstream media. I mean, they always defend his economics, but most people haven't who defend him in the mainstream media haven't even read Keynesian economics. Yeah. And the ones who bash, you know, Austrian school economics, they haven't even read a page or a book or a basic beginner's book of Austrian. So I guess they're meant to, you know, protect the status quo without actually knowing anything about either. Well, maybe it, people in the streets of London will, you know, throw packs of bacon at 10 Downing Street and, and <laughs> do the same as London <laughs> School of Economics. Who knows? Uh, my my next yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's that's kind of funny. My my next story, Eric, is, is about the the Pope coming to the United States, and you know he came to D.C. He went to New York. I guess he even went to Philadelphia, and I get the Eagles won ironically after his visit there. But the funny thing about the Pope uh, coming here is that, you know, he bashes capitalism. He talks about social justice and the environment, but he's supposed to be the main defender of the Christian faith, right? And he didn't seem to really be talking a lot about that because there's a lot of atrocities going on with Christians dying, right? Well, yeah, and that's he can't draw attention to what's going on in, say, Syria, for example, because then there's a backdoor way of criticizing NATO and the United States and our foreign policy. He has also been making a big deal about the refugee crisis and how you know people by the tens of thousands are flowing into Europe and saying that we have a moral obligation and you know <laughs> to care for the poor, to prevent war, and you know the bottom line is that there's no direct you know, spotlighting of what fairly caused the Syrian crisis or the invasion of you know, of Lib- Libya and the you know, tens of thousands of refugees that have come from that as well. So I mean, it's, it's just hypocrisy. Uh, he, he, it's the politicization of the Catholic Church. It's pretty sad to see. I agree. And what pisses me off the most about the Pope, and, you know, there's nothing – Uh, I respect everyone's religious freedom as long as they don't harm anyone else. But what pisses me off the most is he's bashing capitalism but doesn't understand it at all. And look throughout the history. Look at all the great technology and goods and services that have improved people's lives. Now, obviously, some people have made profits off of these things. But the best thing about free markets and capitalism, Eric, is these innovations also help the average guy. So the poor person who was able then with his meager savings and salary, he was able to go out and buy a laptop computer or an iPad that helped him improve his productivity at work so he could get a promotion or things like this. And people don't want to talk about that. Um, There's just not a lot of defenders out there about capitalism and how it helps the poor and the middle class so much uh, with their savings and with uh, you know uh, increased purchasing power, sorry, rather than savings. So they get all the ability to buy all these extra goods and services. Now, you know, maybe people are over consuming and buying a lot of things that they don't need, but the ability is there in a free market to go and buy, you know, educational material. Uh, you know, there's Rosetta Stone for an affordable price and other language material people can buy, software and educational things for an affordable price. But people, you know, obviously are not necessarily going to spend all their money on things that make them more productive. And the social progressives have always believed that. You just need a safety net, a base level of protection that the government would provide, and then the forces of "quote unquote" capitalism would thereafter you know, provision a good, uh, of the most productive use of uh, goods and services for the production uh, of well, you know, wealth for everybody. But the trouble is, is that once government starts getting on and going, it grows and grows, and everything becomes very, very inefficient. Exactly, but th- those are kind of the the lighter version. So you know, Mar- uh, Keynes is Keynes. After reading uh, Henry Hazlitt go line by line through the general theory and failure of the new economics, and reading Keynes' biography with a good amount of his quotes there from the general theory and his view on the economy, Keynes is basically the Diet Coke of Marx. I mean, he's a Marx light. He agrees with a good amount of Marx. 
uh, he, he, he agrees that, you know, uh, a bunch of central planners, PhD economists, that are rational, can allocate capital in the society really well, and that savings are bad, you know, and, and uh, force workers' wages lower, that workers can't have higher. So that's, you know, a proletariat versus that's a, you know, a, an argument there that Marx would use saying, you know, the proletariat uh, has to have always higher wages and yeah. that the, uh, you know, workers are the only thing that matter in, in producing a good and things like that. So it, it's really just kind of kind of stupid that, um, you know, so many people out there you know, they're saying, why do we have capitalism at all? You know, why don't we just eliminate profits? I hear this so much now, Eric. You know, you brought up that people are like, oh, we should have a minimum social safety net. I, I meet a lot of radicals nowadays, and not just, you know, here, boots on the ground in D.C. I, I hear them online, all over the place, not even in, like, commenting on libertarian threads that, you know, they we should eliminate profits. There shouldn't be any capitalism at all. One One listener on a past video of ours even said, you know, capitalism is wrong because then, you know, what is is a baby going to have to pay for his mama's milk? I, I just, I, I don't even know where he learned all that nonsense from. But, you know, like at the family level, like the families would take care of themselves. That's not about the economy. The economy is, you know, trade, how we have gains through trade, right? right. Because I, you and me, I, you can't produce everything you need. I can't produce everything I need. Maybe I can produce better some a few things better than you and we could get gains through trade and i try to explain this at the very basic level to people but these people and maybe they're not dumb maybe they have you know a couple of degrees from a couple of prestigious universities they're just blinded by their ideology that you know they hate profits and they hate capitalism and they may have may or may not have read marx but they're repeating a lot of marx yeah and they're operating on the contradiction as well too you know <laughs> Same kind of thing you'll see in environmental groups. People say, we hate mining. But then again, they'll be saying that on a cell phone when they're talking for an interview or whatever. Or their Tesla, or their Tesla, or their hybrid electric vehicle, which yeah. uses mass amounts of rare earths, which China has destroyed their environment to mine, right? At cheap prices, China has destroyed their soil, their water, their air, all around those rare earths mines so they could bankrupt all the um, environmentally responsible miners that were mining rare earths. They put them all out of business. <laughs> it's just you try I try to have this conversation with people about some solar panels and windmills and you know electric cars and iPhones like you said but you know they they don't wear it and then we see people it frustrates me you know I see a lot of people wearing chase shirts right but they have uh iPhones iPads they drive you know BMWs or Mercedes and yet here they are wearing you know communist basically shirts with people who kicked all the capitalists out and yes there was corruption in Cuba but you know they completely they sided with the with the Soviets so, I mean, they could have gotten the corrupt people out without, you know, going full communist there and stuff like that. And, you know, Che, obviously, he had some other problems with uh, groups he hated and things like that, too. Yeah. So, you got a Hillary example. Yeah, this 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 one's just kind of just kind of funny. Uh, you know, the Clintons are always A-listers, and whether that's you know going to the Hollywood parties, and Bill obviously in the past has been cited having affairs with Hollywood starlets, whether it's Elizabeth Hurley, or uh, that that pretty uh, that other pretty British lady from the science fiction movies. Uh, I forget her name right now, <laughs> but apparently the celebrities are now starting to snub the Clinton Foundation. So the Pope, Elton John, Janet Yellen, among the list of other celebrities who are snubbing the Clinton Foundation now, won't go to their events, won't give them donation checks. Uh, this will probably last all of like two or three years uh, until the dust settles and they're out of the mainstream media cycle, unless, you know, Hillary actually does, is formally charged and maybe ends up in prison. Do, do you still think uh, we're going to see Hillary maybe charged and en end up in jail or something like that? Well, that wasn't my formal forecast. My formal forecast was that she was not going to be nominated for the Democratic ticket, and there's a pretty decent chance, actually, that there would be some repercussions, uh, jail time, and who knows, I mean, uh, she's got quite a bit of Teflon left and could probably get through this, but it, it, when it comes to the political baggage, the polling numbers are already starting to fall pretty precipitously, and um, we'll see. I, I don't... I, you know, the, the Democratic Party's got the problem of not having a deep backbench. You know, I mean, Joe yeah, Biden is hardly a replacement. And 
Yeah. Bernie Sanders scares any, all the business exactly. people, right? So, I mean, like the man on the street who doesn't know anything about capitalism, some of my friends from college who aren't libertarian, uh, you know, they, they have student loan debt, they barely have a job, or they have two, uh, they barely have a full-time job, it's pretty bad, they can barely pay their bills, they have credit card debt too, or maybe they don't even have a full-time job, they have two or three part-time jobs, and these guys love Barry Sanders because, you know, he's making these populist arguments that the government's going to promise them even more things for free. Yep. But the problem is, Eric, there's no such – and if you read Frederick Bastiat or you read Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, uh, you know that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So if a politician like Bernie Sanders promises you, you know, free education, promises you full health care, that money is going to have to come from somewhere. It's going to have to be created through extra taxes on another group or inflation, the, the stealth tax, the wealth tax. You know, it, it's going to have to be transferred probably from the middle class because, you know, the rich can afford the best tax attorneys and the best tax accountants, and they can move their money offshore and things like that. And that's why you get books like, you know, Piquette, who's another, you know, borderline Marxist, saying that, you know, all the world governments need to unite and they all need to issue a global tax on wealth so people can't move their money from one country to another to protect themselves. So it's just Bernie Sanders, he resonates with a lot of people be, uh, because he plays to their emotions. But, you know, the, if you vote for Bernie Sanders, you're ta if you do make an income, you do own a small business, you're going to be the one bearing the brunt of it. Your, your tax, he may tell you your taxes aren't going to go up, but if Bernie Sanders, you know, wins, your, your taxes are almost surely going to go up across the board in pretty much everything. He's, he'll say a good game about, oh, I'm only going to tax the 1%. But reality the, the, well, I agree I agree well well let's let's talk about the numbers okay so our 18 trillion deficit right that's the not the real number obviously that's just the debt clock now they could they could tax everyone a lot more on income and things like that and that may be able to cover it but that's not the real number we have so much money in unfunded liabilities the state of uh, did you see that story about the state of Illinois how uh the state of Illinois was trying to get out from under the um, pension fund liabilities from the teachers unions and others. And the court system told them that tough luck, you made these promises and you're going to have to pay them. So the question is then, you know, they, they almost got a bond downgrade in the last couple months and they promised a tax hike and that stopped it. But you know, there, if you live in the state of Illinois or Chicago or own property there or own a business segment there, they're going to go after your property with higher property taxes and things like that to pay off these obligations. They're, the states are probably not going to be able to get out from these unfunded liabilities. So there is no such thing as a free lunch. And this debt burden is so large, uh, you know, whether it's at different levels of the United States government or on a national level with unfunded liabilities in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all these different pension fund li guarantees and all these things, that Bernie Sanders, right, he's promising people these things, but I really do. You, do you actually think he he understands where the money is going to have to be taken from? Well, I, he just believes that the monies can be generated by debt, and that uh, as the better educated people under his progressive utopian are more productive in generating national income that's taxed, that he'll be able to pay off the debt that he checks out to create this flywheel of his imagination. That's how they justify it, and obviously, you know. It doesn't ever work out that way. The history of the welfare state is writ large for all to see. Uh, you know, yeah, so, it's bigger and bigger. Yeah, I agree. So right now, you know, Bernie Sanders is promising the the populace, uh, the regular American people, more goodies, right? So yeah. this is what de Tocqueville warned against. He warned against that, you know, in a pure democracy, in a mob rule, when we went away from a regular republic, that you know politicians would go on sale, and that the politician who promised the voter the most amount of goodies would, would get the vote in each election. So, I mean, I've tried to have this rational argument with people who support Bernie Sanders a couple times, but, you know, it's it's fallen on deaf ears. They have their mind made up that they hate the status quo, they hate capitalism, they don't want anyone earning a profit, but they should be careful what they wish for. They just might get it. I mean, in that next system, you know, they these guys who say they don't like the system and want to vote for Bernie Sanders, I'm sure they don't like paying taxes already, uh, you know, their tax bill is going to go up. And then uh, it, it's going to be funny to see if, he, if Bernie Sanders does win, what, what way they're going to rationalize this, this uh, cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias, uh, who else they're going to try to blame for why their tax bill went up if the candidate they wanted that promised them, you know, this utopia you said, if, if they, uh, what, what happens afterwards then?
well, they're never going to have to be in that position because Sanders is never going to get elected. <laughs> the powers that be would I, do all from their power to stop something like that from happening. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think – yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, the the population, the popular vote, but, I mean, they can rig elections and they could manipulate the voting boxes and stuff like that. But I just don't see the corporations on either side wanting him because he would come up with so many new tax laws that it would force their cost to go up. Yeah. I, I don't really see them wanting to be compliant. They want, you know, the person who's kind of fascist, where with Obamacare, right, when Obama promised that everyone's taxes would go lower with the health care system, right, which was a head scratcher in hindsight, um, you know, everyone's taxes are higher now for health care. Even if they don't have Obamacare, they still have to pay the tax for it. But if you did get an Obamacare uh, health care, then you know your your healthcare bill rises and you get less coverage and things like that included. It's ridiculous. So I, I, I people just don't learn their lessons, I guess, in voting. But you know uh, it's it's just another stupid round, uh, another rant of mine where I'm kind of fed up with people. You know they 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 kind of read the same stuff and they expect different results and then they don't get different results. <laughs> yeah, I mean I mean w- welcome to dystopia. If we if we can't laugh about it, uh, I'm gonna keep doing the podcast though because you and me get an opportunity to vent like this. <laughs> At, yeah. at least there's a small group of people out there that um, they might not agree with everything we say, but at least, you know, they kind of see things similar way to us. But it, it's just really frustrating that, you know, we need more capitalism. We need lower taxes. We need to put savings and investment back into the economy. We need, you know, the small business person to not have to worry about the Obamacare tax and all these other hidden taxes and all these other rules and regulations that are preventing them from growing their business and, and hiring full-time employees and things like that. That's what would fix the economy, but unfortunately, the exact opposite is happening right now in almost every single industry in the United States. Okay, well, uh, I'm done with my rant now, Eric. Uh, we just want to thank you guys for listening to Welcome to Dystopia, episode number nine. Uh, please give us a thumbs up and share it also throughout social media channels and give us a five-star review on iTunes. Thanks again for your time.